any it's 4 minutes past we'll get started uh, hello everyone uh, i'm shrikant uh, thanks for joining this study circle of cashless consumer where today we'll be focusing on the bharat bill payment system um, roughly an agenda of introduction to cashless consumer uh, and firstly i'll go through the history policy regulations of bbps and then we'll do a quick bit of uh, reading of technical specification on some of the documents that were shared in the reading list uh, and then akshay uh, who's there uh, will run through a sandbox and present a demo uh, of the sandbox and then i'll continue talking on the privacy yes uh, and then we'll have a question and answer session for a bit discussion so before we start uh, i'll probably ask this question uh, on the reading links uh, how many of you uh, went through the document uh, shared in the reading list those who join through youtube uh, you may not be able to see the polls uh, but keep uh, typing on the chat and we will get to know your responses uh, and if you have any questions uh, type them on the youtube chat uh, we'll have them here those who are on the zoom uh, you can uh, raise your hand and i'll unmute you and then chat and this being a study circle you're not going by a strict presentation mode so you can raise your hand uh, anytime uh, and then we'll we'll pause and discuss uh, yeah. uh, the poll I'm going to share the results of the poll. So, uh, three people have read the ONO one. Uh, two others have read uh, some of the links that were shared. Uh, no one read all the links or nobody didn't read anything. So, that's great. At least you have some idea. But we'll still go through uh, what BBPS is and uh, have a quick introduction followed by history. So, first the introduction on cashless consumer uh, if you are not aware uh, we are a, a consumer collective working on digital payments uh, voicing consumer perspective on digital payments and issues uh, we broadly work on advocacy awareness uh, technology data and policy aspects of digital payments we are an open and voices friendly community uh, if you are not uh, joined the telegram group yet uh, please join t.me/cashlessconsumer uh we keep chatting on all things payments in india uh so one on one what is bbps uh it's a centralized uh, interoperable multi channel bill collection payment system that's probably a lot of words uh, to describe uh, a bill payment system uh but uh, each word there reflects uh, some characteristics of the bill payment system uh in fact one of the thing uh, one way to view it is actually as a bill collection system rather than bill payment system uh, where uh, the system is designed to let billers easily collect uh, their dues uh, and let consumers of these their services uh, be it across multiple categories like say electricity water uh, mobile postpaid dth gas and in some case uh, recurring subscriptions school fees college fees or uh, even uh, say some financial products uh, like insurance premiums mutual funds credit card bill payments emis and they can be paid through uh, any channel that the consumer likes so be it uh, visiting a bank branch or uh, using internet banking or paying through any of the web uh, aggregators or mobile apps or kiosks uh, or even atms uh, or through cash uh, by depositing it to uh, registered agents 
so that's what uh, bbps is um, Any questions on the chat? Uh, I'm I'll probably not monitoring the chat. Uh, Akshay, if you're checking on the chat, just uh, speak up if there's something on the chat. Yeah, sure, I'll keep an eye. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we just had a broad definition of PVPS, but uh, how does it look like? Uh, so. Uh, we have uh, multiple billers, so these are the billers. So this could be your mobile phone companies, um, your DTH, uh, your internet uh, companies, your gas companies, your electricity com bill companies. So all these companies uh, generate bills, and they are called as billers. And uh, on the other other end of the side, uh, you, you are you the consumer are there and uh, connecting. You and the biller are a set of entities or a set of uh, agents uh, who manage. Uh... Okay, so Rajat asked a question Can we please take an existing player and look what they do and what their business models might be? Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll come to that uh, in a bit. Uh, so, uh, Firstly, the broader system is where you have uh, multiple billers on one side and consumers on the other side. And uh, there are a set of entities in the middle which uh, connects these two to pay the bill. And uh, so the biller uh, has to first uh, get onboarded or registered with the other side. Sorry? So the biller gets uh, onboarded to an aggregator who is a system provider to manage uh, bill payments for that particular biller and the biller uh, bill aggregator might offer services to multiple billers so there, and there could be multiple such aggregators uh, on, on one side. These are called uh, BBPS biller OUs and then there are uh, and then there is a central entity called uh, BBPS uh, Central Unit, uh, which uh, operates the entire infrastructure connecting both the biller OUs uh, who have uh, data coming in from the individual billers and, uh, and the consumer OUs, uh, which are consumer facing and bill collecting OUs. Uh, and, and these could be banks and non-bank uh, BBPS OUs. Uh, offering the bill payment facility across multiple channels, be it internet banking, mobile banking, or a branch payment, or a kiosk payment, or a payment through non-bank websites, mobile apps, uh, agents, and so on. Uh, and then uh, they route this payment through the biller uh, via the BBPS CU and the BBPS OU. So just for an example that Rajat had asked, uh, let's say you have an Airtel postpaid mobile and uh, you want to pay through, say, um, say a Paytm app. Uh, now, Paytm app here would have to uh, tie up with uh, a BBPS OU. In, in this case, Paytm say is, is even a bank, so they would uh, they would have uh, their own BBPS OU for uh, Paytm which connects to uh, this central unit operated by NPCI uh, and from where it is then connected to Airtel's uh, BBPS uh, OU partner, so which in this case could be say, for example, uh, say Able Desk, right? And, and when you make a payment uh, through uh, ATM, uh, the information flows from your uh, payment provider app, in this case, ATM, all the way to Airtel via, say, uh, their own bank, PBPS OU, and then in PCI, and then uh, the uh, bill desk, which is Airtel's PBPS uh, OU, and then finally reaches the biller. And all these parties who help switch uh, this payment uh, get, uh, say, uh, some portion of revenue of 
for for collecting the bill uh, and let's say in case if you want to pay it, uh, pay it by cash and you want to go to an agent uh, this could be your e seva center uh, across the street and uh, you pay the agent by cash the agent is enrolled uh, by multiple agent networks uh, who are then enrolled into uh, one of the other bbpsou which is connected to uh, the bbps system so this is how uh, when you make a payment for any bill that is part of uh, the bbps system uh, if the payment reaches the biller uh, after getting routed through these intermediary uh, these multiple intermediaries uh, on both uh, consumer side as well as the biller side okay so there is one more chat come into the chat uh, so PDM app pulls the bill from its BBPS OU, which then pulls this data from BBPS, which pulls this data from Airtel. Yes, so technically, uh, the BBPS consumer OU uh, or, or any consumer-facing uh, BBPS OU has to uh, make a bill fetch request uh, to uh, the b- biller OU via the BBPS CU and. Uh, the biller OU responds uh, to the fetch request based on the input parameters. Uh, we'll shortly be seeing uh, the request response uh, when we read through the technical specification as well as go through the sandbox. So to answer your question, yes, uh, the app basically gets connected to its backend where data is getting pulled uh, from the BBPS OU through BBPS CU. Uh, from the source, which is the biller. Um, there are questions. Uh, uh, okay, so Vivek Karna asks, is there any government mandate for all the billers to register on BBPS or is it more of their own bill? Uh, so to answer this question, uh, there is a regulatory mandate uh, prohibiting anybody doing third-party bill collection uh, outside of BVPSOU, uh, whereas uh, any biller, any entity that uh, is billing people uh, does not have any legal mandate, so to speak, uh, to be a part of uh, BVPS. Although uh, in, in the power sector, there is a uh, power sector uh, mandate uh, as part of the power sector reforms, uh, popularly known as Udai scheme, uh, where uh, they do mandate uh, or they do encourage specifically. It's, it's not a legal mandate or a, a law statute based mandate. It's rather a, a memorandum of understanding between the central government and the state government, which operates the discoms uh, to have uh, increased their collections. Uh, the one of the, one salient feature of that MOU is to have all the billers uh, register on the BBPS so, that, so as to they can improve their chances of collecting their bills. Uh, uh, so the one more question. Uh, so BBPS OU is like acquiring banks in payments world, and their job is to get more billers on the platform. Yes, the BBPS uh, biller OUs, their job is similar to that of acquiring banks. There are also BBPS consumer OUs, uh, whose job primarily is to have uh, consumer, uh, be consumer facing and uh, help consumers pay the bills. So it's more like, uh, again, in some sort, uh, you can roughly compare to issuing, although they're not, say, issuing, issuing uh, anything. Uh, maybe you can say they are issuing the bills. Uh, uh, and yes, so uh, a rough analogy can be made uh, like that. Okay, so yeah, keep the questions coming and uh, we'll, we'll take them as we come along and we don't have to wait for the end. Um, uh, so let me move on to the next slide. Which There's is, another question also who yeah. asks uh, when the payment happens, it happens to the biller directly and the entry for the transaction is created with BVPS. So to answer that, yes, Rajat, an entry is created uh, on the ledgers of all the systems that are uh, that are part of this chain. 
and in that way it functions quite very much like a payment system where every party is going to settle to the next party and there'll be a ledger trail over there it's not like when you pay through bbps it goes directly into airtel's account at that moment yeah so so it's it's basically like uh, end of day settlement uh, kind of uh, feature where all payments made from one particular ou to another ou will be settled uh, end of the day and and reconciled and so on and which is why uh, in in the worst case scenario uh, for a bbps payment to get confirmed uh, it might take up to two working days so which is why you should not be paying Uh, if you're paying the bill on the last day, um, it's it's better to avoid BBPS route, which is any of these payment apps, and instead uh, go to say your utility provider's own website. In which case, it's a first-party payment, and you get an instant confirmation. Uh, because there are multiple hops, there are chances of uh, this payment getting verified uh, instantly. might not happen all the time so uh, and there could be a delay up to t plus 2 days uh, yeah so uh, we'll briefly touch upon the history of bill payments in india so how have we collected bills uh, all along uh, so the first uh, i mean the age old practices uh, collecting using cash uh, at a collection point uh, and typically uh, in in case of uh, billers uh, okay this so there are three more questions we'll we'll kind of get those answered before moving to the slide uh, other modes such as re- near real time settlements also exists although this has significant operational risk uh, so i'm going to let kartik speak on it a bit uh, because i am not uh, very sure about the near real uh, time settlement that exists probably kartik can explain us uh, uh, more uh, kartik you can unmute yourself and talk hello yeah kartik yeah, yeah. hi so shrikant hi you mentioned that uh, there was a, a t plus 1 day settlement or end of the day settlement and uh, this is not the only sorry kartik your voice is making yeah real time settlement also to uh, enable billers to get their collections quicker uh, this is purely from, from because uh, as uh, as mentioned in one of some of the uh, writing pieces i believe the blog link which was shared uh, there is the billers are scared once the biller has already integrated with uh, with a platform uh, with an aggregator they do not have that much of an incentive to go to other billers so these are some of the advantages which are offered and uh, this is also led to a lot of issues because uh, you are basically selling settling that biller out of pocket before receiving the money from npci uh, as per the settlement cycle so that was the operational risk component okay so so you are basically settling the biller even before the consumer ou gets the payment uh, which in this case uh, sometimes you know, audible, uh, hello yeah uh, so are you mentioning that uh, the biller ou gets settled even before the consumer ou gets the payment from the consumer is this that what you are mentioning hello am i audible akshay yeah shrikant you are audible i guess we've lost karthik's voice okay we'll uh, we'll probably have karthik back in a bit uh, there is one more question from ravi uh, what has the been the reason for prepaid recharges not being on bbps is it technicalities uh, that's not a bill per se any timelines when it may happen in future uh, i think there are multiple business considerations uh, although i have not actually read uh, any reason by anybody but i presume the reason is more uh, a business reason and we'll come to that point uh, when we talk about the business aspect of pbps uh, and and I'll, I'll revisit this question when, when we get the business point okay so traditionally uh, i'll continue and uh, keep posting your questions or on the chat uh, kartik if you're back uh, you, you can type it on the chat and then we can have you back uh, a while later when your audio is good okay so a brief history uh, on uh, uh, collection so collection has always been at the collection point most often operated by the biller themselves so this could be your 
uh, neighborhood electricity office uh, where you also go and pay the bill in cash uh, and you get an instant receipt and more often uh, since that's a biller operated entity uh, the, there is no uh, risk of uh, settling uh, by a third party so so the when, when you get a receipt uh, the payment is made and and the biller actually gets the money directly i'm like say in bbps uh, where uh, the confirmation can technically take a while uh, and uh, so when it came to the uh, enabling digital modes uh, the earliest reference to uh, bill payments was in an rbi paper on a report on internet banking way back in 2001 and this whole concept was called as electronic bill presentment and payment and this is uh, a concept that kind of slightly predates uh, uh cards and payment uh via online through cards because you technically need not necessarily pay through card uh, but you can still pay uh, electronically through the agent outlets or kiosks and so on like this is more uh, a first world uh, scenario they quote a swedish reference that in 1998 sweden had actually moved a uh, bulk of their bill payments to this uh, euro system and uh, but in india uh, there was a mention about this bill payment in, in that internet banking report uh, but largely bill payments were still offline and in some cases like say a postpaid mobile or uh, broadband service uh, you sometimes had uh, ecs uh, a standing instruction by check uh, which will do recurring debits uh, through mandates and the say probably started from the year 2000 and some people still use ecs uh, but it's probably a big line and then uh, maybe somewhere around 2006 7 we had the online payment gateways and uh, debit card issuance uh, growing significantly and uh, uh, e-commerce transactions through payment gateways were getting popular so you had uh, say your airtel or vodafone uh, having their own website uh, which would have credit card debit card net banking integrations uh, and this is probably somewhere in 2006 7 and it's continues till today and and this is what i meant uh, by saying first party bill payment so when you go to airtel's website and pay your airtel mobile bill it's a first party payment and that uh, payment does not go through vvps um, and then uh, the other mode uh, that was quite popular was through this e seva or in bangalore they call it bangalore one uh, there are lots of different names suvidha providers uh, multiple names in multiple cities but these are basically uh, an operator run uh, uh, internet cafes or uh, government uh, or service access points where you can go and pay through cash and uh, do a range of things including bill payments uh, ticket booking and so on and this was popular from year 2010 to 2015 and it still uh, exists uh, in entire two uh, cities in india and, and uh, somewhere in 2013 uh, the mobile wallets uh, the prepaid instruments this is when the paytms and the free charge uh, of the world uh, offered bill payment facility and roughly around the same time uh, some atm networks also had the option of paying uh, bills by atm itself uh, and, and then uh, uh, we have two interesting reports we've shared that in the reading materials as well there one is uh, a feasibility study of implementing giro payment system in india and that's uh, i i use i call this as giro report uh, in this presentation and uh, that was presented in 2013 sometime and the next year in 2014 there was another committee that was set up uh, that was called as giro advisory group uh, or, or in short gag uh, which again produced one more report we we'll, we'll go through what these reports uh, suggested and uh, uh, and bbps has been operational since 2017 and uh, one point to note is that uh, all channels uh, especially when they operate uh, in a cross ou fashion where your biller ou and your consumer ou are different uh, it has to mandatorily pass through bps and they are all subsumed into a single network uh, so uh, 
briefly on the path to BBPS. Uh, we have a, a GIRO uh, and GAG report. So the highlights of the GIRO report are, uh, so what's GIRO first? Uh, it's, it's a mode of payment where payment is made uh, via a bank uh, for any activity. And it's, it's it uh, as shared uh, in one of the tweets earlier, it, it predates a uh, uh, long way back to 4th century BC, uh, where somewhere in Egypt, uh, they did try uh, Giro payments. And there are references of Giro payments, uh, something like where you have an intermediary, a banking intermediary who will process payments. Uh, and uh, how is it different from a check? Uh, because in a check, it's usually... Uh, a debit based pull so uh, whoever you are to give the check has to go and submit that check to a branch and then uh, a debit based pull happens so a pull of your money from your account into whoever is presenting that check happens whereas in the giro uh, payment scheme it's a push uh, that is initiated by the payer uh, to the payee uh, and it's a credit based push uh, so that's that's a basic uh, difference between a check and a gyro uh, instrument. And uh, the report also went into the landscape of bill payments in India uh, and how electricity sector, uh, like across, uh, they chose uh, 10 electricity billers uh, for a sample and then gave some data about uh, how much cash payment and how much check payment is being made, what portions of it uh, is uh, is made through their own collection points. Uh, which are called biller own collection points uh, and how they can actually increase uh, this payment of bill through a variety of payment instruments and uh, create a EVPT market. Uh, and uh, they noted about the opportunities uh, as to uh, about having a Giro payment system, which could then help multiple other entities collect uh, bills or have this ability to uh, or have their consumers the ability to push payments. And uh, one, uh, it, it also would lead to reduction of cash and check usage. Uh, one point it was it noted was the lack of trust in the agent model uh, where consumers preferred uh, paying uh, through biller owned collection points, even it meant say traveling a mile or two and uh, standing in line and paying as opposed to say paying in your neighborhood Kirana store, which acts as an agent. Because uh, there were issues of uh, the agent not passing the bill and then the bill gets defaulted and so on. So there was a lack of trust in the agent model. Uh, that was one of the key pain points. And uh, the uh, the report notes uh, absence of interoperability. And I kind of uh, extended that to say that uh, the regulator tried to level the playing field and in, in some sense, shuffled the existing market uh, to do a creative destruction. By that, what I mean is, uh, uh, I mean, if we talk the names of players, uh, there was one player which was big enough in, in the bill payments space, that's, that's Bill Desk, and there were two other competitors as well to Bill Desk. But Bill Desk was the majority market share holder in the case of biller uh, OUs or, or uh, the payment company which provides services to billers, electricity company in most cases, uh, because by back in 2013, it is largely electricity companies which had uh, a huge volume of uh, bill collection, closely followed by a nimble mobile industry. But even mobile industry had largely been prepaid and uh, the mobile uh, slash broadband industry was just uh, across in few cities in India and it's not a big market. But this one player had uh, a lot of uh, market share. And what it also meant was for newer uh, entities uh, going approaching billers to convert their existing bill uh, billing systems into this uh, EBPP framework meant that uh, the newer players found it hard uh, because of the network effects. And, uh, one example could be, let's say, uh, there were billers who tied up with a certain mobile wallet provider, which would mean that if you had to pay that bill electronically, you have to have that particular wallet or pay by cash, and no other modes were allowed. 
so this kind of breaks in the interoperability so this was one reason for the regulator to kind of note and intervene and uh, leveling the playing field of course uh, thereby saying uh, the stronger players have to be part of an interoperable network so that uh, they also enable uh, other players to be part of the network and we move to a more standard spaced uh, collection system and what it also explored was how do we license uh, the evpps so till that point of time uh, the uh, players were largely unlicensed uh, we have one more question coming in uh, sham asks who manages the backend and systems for evps and if you are a billing provider how the api consistencies consistencies are maintained especially load and scale uh, i'll probably uh, let akshay uh, answer this when he touches on uh, the system we'll, we'll quickly finish the introduction part and before getting the technical part uh, so yeah it also explored a licensing framework for this entire industry and how do how do we get these fintechs providing these bill payment solutions into a licensing mode uh, and it also sought uh, a channel or a payment mode uh, or in, in case both to converge into a single network so that it, there could be network effects of the larger network uh, so this is probably one thing that the earlier report did and they also did a global study and compared how various countries are approaching gyro payments and one thing to particularly uh, make note of was they did make a note of uh, sadat model which is sadat is the gyro payment system in saudi arabia uh, where uh, they have a crazy system where uh, a central entity which operates uh, a central uh, point of uh, system central database kind of pulls all the bills from all the billers and maintains a database and then uh, lets anyone else query that database uh, while making a payment and this the committee noted uh, would be tedious and that would be data inconsistency issues and hence uh, and even privacy issues it noted in the report uh, and and hence chose to uh, prefer an online mode uh, uh, which is what we have currently wherein uh, bills are fetched online and then uh, the transactions happen online which is why all the vbps ous have to be online uh, all the time so this was the giro report that was submitted in may 2013 and then there was a, a gag uh, a, a, so giro report kind of uh, laid down broad contours of what today's bbps looks like uh, and called it uh, india bill payment system ibps uh, and it suggested recommending uh, setting up and operationalizing ibps it didn't go into details of what the entities of ibps are so that's when the next report called uh, giro advisory group report uh, that was published in april 2014 uh, uh, explored on and it uh, among the things that it did there was it changed the name to uh, bharat bill payment system uh, and then it uh, it kind of noted down in detail a, a tiered model of a bbps central unit where there will be a single entity uh, operating uh, a central entity and having multiple bbps ous both on the consumer side and the biller side and they then could have their own agents and so on so the, it it proposed a tiered structure for the bbps system and it also uh, laid down the contours for licensing bbps central unit uh where it said where it kind of discuss should this central unit be a profit uh a for profit entity or a not for profit entity and how should this entity uh bbps cu uh be licensed and uh, there are claims that uh, there was favorable treatment for npci given in this uh, this has been documented by amol kulkarni of cuts uh, in in this report on uh, competition in digital payments where this his his argument basically is that rbi kind of laid down uh, the licensing criteria so narrowly that only npci qualified to kind of uh, apply for the license 
because it said it has to be a not for profit and it has to be in payments business for x amount of years and all these criteria meant that only npci could apply for that license and npci eventually did got that bbps cu approval and it started operations of bbps in july 2017 Uh, okay, let me just quickly check if there are any questions in YouTube. There's nothing, and uh, so uh, we'll quickly touch upon the regulatory policy aspects. Uh, uh, one is uh, where all the RBI, since it regulates the payments of certain systems, it said uh, nobody can offer third-party payment systems. outside of bbps uh, and uh, all players who are currently offering uh, b- uh, bill payment services has to enroll themselves as bbps ous uh, and uh, at the start of the bbps uh, system and it also meant that all the agents who are involved in the entire chain of all the billers uh, uh, ous get enrolled into the system and their uh, uh, and uh, so uh, this is uh, something that uh, is said in one some places and it, it's largely an interpretation on the legal legalities and regulations so this is probably a formal to lawyers uh, any of whom are watching uh, is uh, there is a mandate from rbi which suggests uh, all third party bill payments has to be through bbps uh, but is it really so and can there be uh, bill payments outside uh, of of bbps uh, even if it in the case of third party bill payments uh the first party bill payments can be outside of bps uh in in 2019 september rbi expanded to more biller categories from electricity and water to other uh, categories like school fees and so on and in october uh, they made an on tap authorization framework for any entity to get itself licensed as a bps ou uh from the business side of it uh, one of the notions or the uh, arguments noted in the uh, initial giro committee report is to improve competition in the aggregator space uh, but it's uh, has it improved the competition is a question to be asked uh, and there are no clear answers the market leaders are still the same and uh, there aren't there haven't been any new uh market leaders or uh market entrants in the space uh besides the existing ones and uh what it also did was uh it kind of unified uh, all these uh mobile payment agents uh in in a sense that uh, all these mobile wallets or upi apps which uh, now suddenly have a system where they can uh embed themselves into bill- billing framework uh, without having to enter into agreements with each uh, pillar or use separately uh, and the uh, bbps is one key driver to upi's growth so upi's uh, recurring uh, payment use cases has uh, a, a significant number of people use upi uh, to pay bbps and uh, upi drives its volume through bbps and this is an interesting part uh, where the convenience fee model is still unregulated so as you can know that there are multiple channels and in multiple channels the convenience fees are varying degree and in some channels there are also agent commissions and so on and this is not standardized uh, yet and uh, there are still we are probably in in, in the quote on quote say vc funding era where uh, the all these convenience fees are zero dated for the growth of the platform but uh, clearly sometimes soon there will be convenience fee uh, that that gets uh, coming on to our way and which is already there in the uh, cash payment mode where there are there is a convenience fee mode uh, in in the existing uh, cash mode of payment even if you pay any of these bills through e seva centers and so on and uh, uh, a new business development was uh, earlier in this month access bank launched uh, bbps for school fees and uh, that's uh, that's a newer uh, pillar category that was added uh, and trust on agents uh, again was one of the reasons cited for uh, bbps to come in existence has it increased uh, uh, any better or uh, 
as the settlement time uh, become better we don't have answers for these things data is not available so now is uh, the technical specifications reading time so i'll quickly go through the reading materials we did uh, so we touched upon the 101 and uh, we mentioned briefly about the internet banking report and uh, we saw a high level summary of the giro report and the gag report next up would be uh, bbps technical standards so what this document does is basically provides a overall technology uh, framework uh, like who has to be like uh, what should be the technical process through which uh, bbps system has to be built like uh, the network requirements the software hardware requirements of bbps ou cus uh, uh, how their applications should uh, interact uh, uh the master data management which akshay would be covering in a bit uh which contains the list of pillars and so on and what are the process of uh, data storage an important point here to note from the context of privacy and data is that uh, data has to be stored for a period of at least 5 years uh complaints management uh, how are pii's managed uh for privacy uh i know it says uh, non mandatory customer details like email aadhar pan can be passed along from an ou uh, cu and then to the customer ou i don't know how well this uh, works in compliance with the aadhar regulation itself uh, uh, this is a question to be asked uh, and uh, they have a Uh, internal system they call it as canvas which is basically a, a coordination portal for all the bbps ous amongst the cus and uh, the data security requirements uh, the digital certificate and the signing of data that happens so any message that comes from the ou to the cu uh, gets signed uh, by the ous uh, uh, key and then encrypted by cus public key which then gets decrypted at cu and then the uh, hash is verified against the ous public key so uh, the cu in this case being npci gets any data incoming from an ou we'll see what these data are in the technology api specifications uh, so basically npci gets all this data it, it decrypts it uh, verifies the signature to ensure that it's not tampered and then proceeds with the transaction right and uh over the data security uh password policies uh, and operational details for uh, ous uh, these are all and the api messages and this is something that we'll uh, go in detail uh, both in the api spec uh, readings there's another question i believe uh Uh, any stats on what percentage of bill payments in india is captured by bbps currently in terms of uh, volumes and value uh, this is a very interesting question uh, there are multiple data sources to uh, point, arrive at this data point and uh, varied by sector uh, one thing is we do know that uh, the electricity receivables data of all discoms Uh, it might be hard to kind of compile that but it should be available because all these discounts to publish their annual statements you do have uh, their receivables uh, published and you will also have uh, 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 there is a site which i open uh, it's called dgp uh, dashboard so this is a uh, meti uh, dashboard of uh, all the digital payments uh, to track the digital payment initiatives and uh, what this has is a section on bbps transaction uh, where uh, i think this is slightly outdated uh, where it has to june 19 but uh, i think there is one other place where it tracks till the current month uh, but if you see this has like uh, value Uh, volume of transactions on the bbps network but if you drill down uh, you will actually get uh, by sector and as you can see electricity is the a high volume uh, sector in bbps and uh, roughly this is like what 
32 million uh, transactions that happened in the month of May, and that's probably uh, the amount of uh, BBPS uh, electricity bill uh, transactions that happened, of which you need, one needs to tally it along with the BBPS uh, stats from NPCI that's reported to RBI, and you could get rough sense of how much is going through BBPS. Uh, one thing to note here is uh, there are two other ways in which the BBPS data is not captured. So one is if you pay, if you make a first party payment, uh, it's, it's paid to your own electricity biller and that data is not captured in BBPS. If you also pay, let's say, through your own BBPS uh, biller uh, OU, and if your biller OU and the consumer OU is the same, let's say, for example, you go to a bill desk site and then make a bill payment, uh, and the bill desk also happens to be an OU for your electricity provider, and then that transaction does not flow through uh, BBPS central system and does not get captured as part of it. So, yeah, one needs to actually work on this and uh, arrive at a number. It's, it's a hard uh, job because the numbers are not readily available, but it's probably we are heading towards, uh, I, I would say at this point of time, maybe 50 to 60 percent would be, uh, this is a guesstimate uh, because most of the cash payments collected through the agent channel is now on DVPS. And uh, if, you, if one treats India as a cash country, then uh, all, all the cash payments that happen for electricity bill payments happen through BBPS already, through the agent channel. And uh, there could be some modes where people kind of already pay through the biller-owned uh, collection points or, uh, say, the websites of the providers themselves, which could be still roughly probably somewhere around 20-30%. So the rest of the volume, I would assume, goes through BBPS. So, I guess that kind of answers that question. Uh, so we'll come back. Uh, we were reading the standards document. So we'll, we'll go through the API specifications in a bit uh, in detail. And there is also clearing and settlement uh, procedures as to how the settlements happen between multiple providers. Uh, and uh, there's a certification process uh, which says how OUs can get themselves certified. This talks about the BBPS simulator. We'll briefly see what that was. This was live a few months back. It's not available anymore. And there are some uh, business requirements for certifications. This talks about various API uh, endpoints, which Akshay would be going through in detail. Uh, and uh, there are some notes about scheduled activities and downtime and list of application. So this is the technical standards document. This basically uh, gives a high level overview of how the technology should work and what are the requirements for this technology to get running. And then we have the API specifications, which is more the uh, uh, data handling part or, or, or how the apps interact with the system uh, through APIs, uh, different APIs, and, and how the flow goes through. So the classic uh, two major API responses are basically the bill fetch request and response and the bill payment request and response. Additionally, there could be transaction check uh, and a bill validation. So, but bill fetch uh, being the most uh, common one. Uh, this is prob this is a bill fetch request from a customer OU uh, to BBPS central unit where they say, "I want to fetch uh, this particular detail uh, of this particular customer. Customer's mobile number is this, and mobile number is used here because that's probably a key." for biller to identify and present the bill. So this will be passed on to the biller and the biller use this as an ID uh, to, press, uh, to fetch the query the bill from their database and then uh, uh, present the bill. And there are also a bunch of uh, tags around uh, if an agent is involved, what's the channel, what's the payment mode uh, that the user is going to prefer, the, uh, details of uh, the agent and it's important to note that 
uh, even if you say pay by Google Pay, technically Google Pay is actually a mobile agent uh, when it comes to the BVPS system. And uh, what gets passed along here is basically your mobile number, your geo code, uh, which resolved into a postal code, your IP, uh, your channel would probably be UPI uh, or, or mobile banking. Uh, your terminal ID won't be shared in this case, but your IMEI, your OS, uh, your application version, which will be like Google Pay or whatever, right? Uh, and this will be shared in, as part of the request payload and uh, build details uh, would essentially have the biller ID because you would, in your app, you would say, I am from Bombay and fetch me my Vodafone bill. And this is my Vodafone number. And these are uh, the bill details passed as part of the bill fetch. And then the CU uh, would, in, uh, so when this request is made, it is signed by the Customer OU encrypted by BVPS CU's keys, decrypted by BVPS CU, and uh, then passed on to BVPS Biller OU, uh, who then gets uh, this request, basically, which passes the same data back to the biller. And then the biller responds to the CU, uh, saying this is the bill amount, and this is a one time bill amount, or this has to be paid monthly. Uh, or uh, as presented whenever there is a bill due. And this is the minimum bill amount. This is a, a total due. This is probably an advance amount or something. And you can have custom tags here. And the BBPSCU then passes that piece of information to the OU, which then displays on your app. Uh, and this is just the bill fetch cycle. And here you have detailed uh, metadata about the entire schema. You will have a bunch of analytics used for risk, uh, transaction risk scores, and there are external risk providers used, and uh, details of the agent, the device details, uh, bill, biller details, uh, customer parameters, and so on. And uh, so the this then is the next step is the bill payment request, which again says that, okay, Google Pay would now say that I have collected uh, some money from this person. I want to initiate a payment request. So after Google Pay uh, completes the UPI transaction, it would make a BVPS payment request to the, uh, as a customer OU to the CU. And in that it will again fill in all these details and then also fill in the mode and the payment method. Uh, so I collected through say UPI and this is a full payment and this is an offers payment because you know I am uh, assigned with say a particular OU whereas the biller is having uh, with a different OU in which case the settlement happens. Uh, okay, there are a bunch of uh, things in the chat. Uh, so I'm gonna unmute. Uh, uh, touch it and probably have him ask these questions. Yeah, yeah, Rajat, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, Rajat. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, what I'm trying to sort of track here is uh, also the movement of money. Uh, so, for example, in this case, Google Pay is a UPI app. And then, you know, the first UPI transaction uh, is then from my account to its own account. And then it sort of makes a, a, a bill payment request where now the money is going to move through the BBPS system. Is that how it works? Yes. And it, so even though technically, say, uh, from your UPI app, you can even pay directly to a merchant's UPI VPA. <laughs> But that's not how it happens when you use uh, the bill payment flow in, in any of the payment apps because the payment app in this case acts as an agent. And that's similar to how like you pay the cash to the agent here and then the money from the agent gets uh, debited into the uh, agent's partner and then from the agent's partner to uh, it, it goes on to a settlement file from where the biller OU finally gets. And this settlement happens daily. And so 
to answer your question so even though you make a upi payment you are not actually making the upi payment directly to the biller you are only making the upi payment to the google pay app or whichever app in this case okay i see and uh, for example in another case this could have been uh, uh, imps or uh, a net banking payment as well if this was or, or even it could be a, a debit card payment like i can still use phone pay and choose to say that i want to pay by debit card or credit card and and it still uh, so for phone pay what uh, happens is uh, it it first makes the payment transaction so where i choose debit card or credit card i complete the payment flow the payment is uh, getting uh when phone pay gets a confirmation that that transaction succeeded and when it gets succeeded it i basically hits into their account and they then initiate uh, a bbps request uh upon confirmation that the payment is successfully received uh, and then that uh, payment that is just a data flow that flows through bbps where phone pay says that look hey shrikant has paid me whatever amount for this particular bill Uh, and i have collected that amount and i will pay whoever the biller is uh, so please confirm this payment through this bbps message so uh, phone pay will then forward a request to uh, bbps cu and pci in this case and then that transaction gets logged in the cu and phone pay will get a settlement uh, at the end of the day saying that look uh, you said you collected payment from shrikant through whatever mode that you wanted uh, so now you, that bill has to be settled with airtel so you got to pay uh, so the settlement account from of phone pay will get detected and airtel will be paid uh, cutting through the switching charges okay and this uh, settlement uh, is is it a sort of a standard uh, transactional protocol that these guys have uh, mandated or is it between then say phone pay or airtel how they want to uh, no, this settlement is centrally handled by npci so which is what i mean we also have a, a recent issue about by party uh, settlement uh, uh, agreements so we will touch upon that towards the end uh, but yeah the settlement is all handled at npci level because any bvps message that you sent gets logged at npci and npci uh, collates all the uh, bvps transactions and creates a settlement file uh, so settlement is centrally coordinated by npci okay and in this case when we take a debit card sort of um, quest, uh, uh, payment method the the uh, debit card payment gateway fee in this case uh, because uh, of you know us using up uh, you know phone pay they don't sort of want to make a difference between a upi and a debit card then that uh, payment gateway fee basically phone pay is taking a hit on its own right right that's that's what is happening currently and which is why uh, which is where there is a provision in bbps uh, to add customer convenience fee and the customer ou uh, in this case phone pay uh, can actually change the convenience fee based on the payment type let's say you want to incentivize a particular payment method you can keep the fee low and uh, you want to incentivize another payment method you can keep a fee high or a classic case would be uh, if you want to may avoid people paying through credit cards and credit cards since they have a higher mdr you might want to pass on the uh, cost of uh, transaction directly as a convenience fee or a credit fee uh, as against say a upi or a debit card for which the mdr is zero okay and uh, maybe i can ask more questions later i guess uh, you can continue but yeah there's okay. lots of interesting stuff coming to my mind sure yeah. and uh, swapnil has a question another on... point to add to the payment methods thing uh, here is that it's also the choice of the uh, cou the customer operating unit to show certain methods of transaction or not so because let's say credit cards are the highest rated mdr uh, mode so some cous might all together skip showing you an option to pay via credit card so that part is not uh, mandated anywhere by npci it's just that you have to let them know in advance what modes of payment you would be collecting and they will publish those same details on both sides of the network to the billers as well as to the uh, consumer side so it's not mandatory anywhere to accept all modes of payment 
ஒரு <laughs> the bbps system uh, then any of the transactions that will from any mode or any of the aggregator so say will you know uh, question one is will phone pay automatically have that school um, you know available as like a biller where people can come and pay these bills and second uh, you know is uh, and will all of this now transactional data and all of the data flow through me as the acquirer of the biller and the payments as well so first is is it like seamless where people can automatically see this as a biller and then sort of the data flows through our system so my system in this case uh, and then who owns this data etc what are the usages that people can sort of do on this uh, you know in this on this data given i've seen you know whenever i was researching this i saw a lot of uh, mention of public credit registry credit scores etc yeah we will we'll come to the data governance part in a bit we will uh, slightly behind time but we, we we do cover the data governance part and owns data and there is a interesting discussion around that uh, but i'll probably cut you there now uh we'll have that uh swapnil asks do we have insurance companies and mutual funds on bbps payments yet uh i don't think they are live uh, yet uh but they might come on board uh, uh i am and this is but from an rbi perspective there is no uh, ban or anything of that sort any category of biller can now be a part of bbps so i think it fundamentally works out to be the cost of collection for them uh, in in bbps as against to their existing modes so if they are uh, more uh, geared towards bbps then they will probably see if they are again it depends on their user base if they feel that their own collection infrastructure uh, does a better job at a cheaper for them then they would have no incentive to join uh, bbps because you can still have for, for say mutual fund and insurance you can still have uh, let's say collection through brokers and their own networks and and that does not uh, and the bbps guideline does not affect there because the bbps guideline says only for third party bill payments whereas in the case of insurance and uh, mutual fund it's technically not a bill uh, so i don't think that uh, there is a restriction legally to use bbps but they and it's up to them basically to see whether uh, they want to use bbps to uh optimize their collection cost or not I mean, in some cases bps might be optimal for them in some cases it might not depends on the business so we'll quickly move on and uh, so there is a bill fetch request and bill fetch response that we saw and then there is a bill payment request and bill payment response so again similar uh, structures you can go through the xsds uh, and uh, a transaction reference id gets created here this is probably the most uh, important point here and this is when it uh, this is important to for it to actually be then used in say subsequent disputes or uh, 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 settlement issues and so on uh, so, so this is the uh, key thing to note here everything else is pretty much the same uh, it it notes the payment method what was the payment method and whether it was a full payment or a partial payment and so on and uh, uh, and again the, the request response flows goes similar from customer oeo to ceo and then ceo to biller oeo and the response cycle flows back to the reverse order uh, and then there is a sample reversal request so this happens uh, for whatever reason like uh, if say for example phone pay uh, pass this request whereas on the other side say the credit card transaction like fail uh, or uh, you want to do a reversal or in some case you want to do a refund sort of thing you can again do a reversal request uh, again the flow goes through uh, consumer oeo to uh, ceo to biller oeo and the response back to the same cycle 
uh, and this has implications on the settlement because it's, it's basically a chargeback on the bill payment, uh, so to speak. Um, so this also has a similar structure. And then the transaction check uh, is basically when you have uh, not got a confirmation from the biller OU on the payment. Whereas you have got, as a customer OU, you have got the money and you have forwarded your request, but you have not got a successful response, payment successful response on the biller end. In which case you can actually give a, I mean, for example, phone pay gives a status saying that we had a problem, but do come in and in a day and check and then in a day and uh, after a day we can go to the same page and say check status and that will go to this API and it will pass the same transaction ID uh, and, and uh, if then for that transaction uh, the status has changed uh, then that will be reflected and that will be reflected all the way to the consumer app and this helps basically for the consumer get a confirmation that the bill was indeed paid and not got stuck to the agent. Um, while this again technically solves the agent trust problem, uh, but in real world, you know how these APIs work and uh, say a delay and one of these uh, request responses could mean that the customer gets loses the same trust and probably prefers to go uh, to the first party payment mode. Uh, this is again the API uh, request response for that. Uh, there is also a bill validation request and response uh, which uh, in, in some cases you might have seen that uh, the apps let the customer enter the amount uh, and uh, let them pay. Uh, in, in such cases, it's probably, uh, or in some other cases, uh, actually I was referring that there are customer OUs who cash the bill uh, payment details. Uh, in some cases, it might have gotten stale because you would have tried with one app uh, and then uh, it might not have succeeded. But you would have go to the other uh, other app, uh, let's say a couple of days uh, after. Uh, but the status of that bill, whether it was paid through another app or another channel, is not known to the uh, uh, customer OU. There, uh, they are supposed to do a bill validation before accepting a payment. Uh, this is to ensure that you don't kind of accept a double payment because you know somebody, uh, the customer himself, made it uh, through a different channel. So. Uh, just to be on the safer side before making a payment request, you do a bill validation request to ensure that the details are correct, the bill value is correct, and its bill is not yet paid and there is an outstanding. Right? And the request response flows the same way to the CU, to the biller OU, and back in the same order. Uh, and this is more like a diagnostic or a heartbeat uh, for the entire system where uh, a diagnostic request is sent uh, from anybody uh, to anyone else in the system to uh, do a health check. Uh, and uh, there's also a complaint related API where you know somebody says that I did pay and uh, your payment is not got reflected. Uh, in, say, in some cases, say the customer OU would have checked, uh, they have received the payment, they have made the VPS request, uh, but then uh, the biller OU even might have kind of said uh, payment received. But the customer uh, might have got a call from the biller saying that you have not paid the bill. And then the customer goes to the BBPS C, uh, COU and then COU lodges a complaint. And then there's basically again another chargeback kind of system where you can handle complaints and grievances. Uh, and uh, status of that will be updated. So a bunch of uh, complaints. Uh, this again affects the settlement uh, for the OUs themselves because, you know, which. Uh, whether there has to be a reversal or a settlement or a uh, chargeback will all be decided based on this complaint status and uh, complaints are then closed. Uh, so then there is a master data management. This is basically to uh, give you a list of builders who are available on the platform. This is how you know apps display uh, by category if you select electricity, it will show a list of 30 billers, and that's basically coming from master data management. Uh, like, who are the billers that are alive? Uh, what modes they take? Uh, do they? Uh, is their uh, database offline or online? Uh, this is like uh, how whether the biller kind of has an online database so that like across channels the bill details. When when I say across channels, uh, in, inside and outside of PPS. 
the build data is synchronized or is it synchronized on a batch mode, let's say end of day, uh, which is to signify whether the builder is online or offline, uh, whether the builder accepts any random uh, amount as a bill payment, even when there is no bill. And so these kind of metadata is then uh, provided per builder and any customer OU can fetch uh, like these uh, data and cache in their master data to kind of show what is the amount of uh, bill that can be paid to a particular biller and so on. Uh, and the fetch request and response, uh, this also has like the interchange fee details what is the interchange fee for this particular OU uh, or this particular mode and so on. Uh, uh, there is also an agent uh, MDM uh, that is there, which kind of gets this, all the agents that are available uh, uh, to the billers uh, and the OU. So this is uh, more uh, important in the context of say the uh, cash handling agents, so where is the shop and so on. Uh, and uh, I think we will skip this. We are kind of way back on time. We'll, we'll give a pass, but if you find anything interesting, do let us know. Uh, or if you have any questions specifically, we'll cover them. Otherwise, I'm going to probably go to the slide back. And uh, so this was uh, a pre-sandbox that was enabled uh, by, I don't know who, NPCA or somebody, but the site was indiabillpayment.com. It had like a sandbox running live. So if you are actually an OU, uh, be it customer OU or a builder OU, you can actually point to this particular server and you know, give a re request response and it will give you a sandbox uh, response. And, and let's say it has multiple parties on the sandbox, so you, you kind of act like a real UAT environment kind of stuff. Uh, so this again has uh, these APIs for uh, bill payment, diagnostic, transaction status. Right, and with that, I'll we'll come to the end of this and I'll over to Akshay for demo. Hey, uh, thanks, Srikant. So, uh, uh, there was a question in chat somewhere uh, which asked, uh, which was asked by Sham, so who asked, Who manages the backend and system for BVPS? And if you are a billing provider, how the API consistencies are maintained, especially load and scale? So Sham, reading this technical specification, I hope this question of yours why, uh, was why answered. Uh, BBPS uh, uh, publishes the technical standards and the complete XML request response models, which all the participating entities, which will be the OUs, whether it's a COU or a BOU. COU means the consumer operating unit, which is mostly going to collect the payments on consumer's behalf and the BOU, which is the biller operating unit, which is going to be showing you the bill uh, details and stuff. So both of these have to adhere by these technical standards. And that's one of the contractual obligations they have to fulfill to be a part of the BBPA system. And uh, is there any monitoring? Uh, who does this monitoring for the systems? Uh, any authority who will be uh, responsible and ownership? API that uh, both the systems are supposed to ping uh, BBCU, I guess, every five minutes or something, so that they know that particular systems are up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, there was another interesting question in chat, which asked how, do, how does Access Bank make money uh, when the schools are paying and does it matter if, the, uh, if their current account is with Access Bank or not? To partially answer that question, what we will do is uh, we will run through a sandbox of the BVP COU system that has been provided by Federal Bank. Uh, the important thing to note here is uh, currently banks and very limited other parties have been allowed to become an OU, an operating unit, and uh, Federal Bank is a designated BBC OU, which means it is allowed to uh, collect payments from the consumers 
Now their motivation behind publishing these APIs is uh, to enable apps like uh, Paytm, PhonePay, or probably anyone else who starts, uh, who wants to start collecting bill payments and get into this business, or probably even some agency which has a good network of agents and they want to register so they could implement these APIs on their backend. Now what we saw in the actual technical standard document was walls and walls of XML data, which is not very user friendly, nor is it very consumable. Yes, it is slightly more readable for humans, but we're not talking about human interaction with the data. We're talking about machine to machine interaction. So one of the things that uh, Federal Bank has done, or probably I guess most of the other OUs would also be doing is to, um, is to make these APIs simpler to integrate and consume for their customers. So for BOUs, these will be billers and for COUs, these would be the potential payment apps or agents, uh, agent institutions or agent networks. So uh, that's one of the first value added service that you give on top of the existing BBPS network. And uh, there's also transaction charges on most of the payments on a per transaction basis. So these are basically some of the avenues where you could uh, make money on these kind of integrations. And also uh, the thing is that even if you want to become a COU on your own to start accepting payments, it's not something that you can decide that uh, let me apply for this license and cut out the middleman. So that kind of gives an edge to most of the bank players and whoever uh, else has a OU license. So they leverage these kind of things to make money on top of this. So let's see what Federal Bank actually has done on the part of uh, COUs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to display a postman collection of the five basic requests that any COU party would be needing to run their uh, COUs. And there are two additional ones which are related to complaint, which I have skipped for the purpose of this demo. So uh, let's look at the first one, which is the Biller MDM, Master Data Management. What this does is it gives you a list of all the uh, billers that are registered with NPCI at that moment. So you could fetch this data from NPCI and you could, uh, you could create a UI on top of it, or you could simply just show a list of saying, hey, all these people are available on my platform for you to pay. And there are certain other details also such as which parameters does this particular entity use to search for the customer bills? What are the uh, modes of payment that are accepted, etc. So uh, I'll be running through the request response models as well. To, just to give you an idea of what these requests are. The second one is get bills. So this is when let's say you see a list of uh, entities, you select your electricity company, and then you have to enter some sort of an identifier, which could be your registered mobile number, or your connection number or your bill number, whatever that is. And this gets, uh, gets passed on from the BBP COU to BBP CU, which is NPCI. I'll replace the term BBP CU with NPCI so that it's easier to understand. Right now, I don't think we are going to see a multi BBP CU model anytime soon. So I'll just use NPCI for ease of understanding. So from a COU, this data gets passed on to NPCI, which then uh, converts it into the standard uh, BOU format and passes it on to the biller system, which responds back with the corresponding bill value. So another important thing to understand in the technical standards is that the BOU system is effectively uh, working as a server in this case, where BBC, uh, PCU, NPCI is the client and they have uh, the biller has to expose the endpoints for their system be queried and payment data to be updated over there. And NPCI is the client for that system. Whereas in case of COU, it works the reverse because the transactions and interaction is happening on the COU side. So NPCI is the server in that case and COU is the client. So for a COU, request will always originate on the COU side, go to NPCI and get a response. In case of billers, the request will originate from NPCI go to the biller system or BOU and get a response from there. So yeah, using the identifier, you search for the bill 
and then there are certain validation guidelines there's no certain criteria fix that you have to do or what happens if you don't do so uh, what you could do is let's say you fetched a customer's bill and you cache it on your client side and next time the customer searches with the same identifier you do you show the bill even without making a request to the npci but in that case before accepting a payment you should always validate the bill of course for the reasons that uh, shrikant gave that uh, the bill should not have been made a payment elsewhere or another reason could be if there are late payment charges or something like that you should always validate a bill so that's the third one now what happens after this uh, bill fetch and validation is that the consumer makes a payment using whichever mode of payment is exposed by the cou app or cou agents and once the payment is completed on their end they uh, the cou has to notify npci that i have collected this bill this much amount against this bill and i am going to settle it to you so please acknowledge this and uh, npci forwards a similar request to the biller saying we received this much amount against this bill number or bill id or whatever their unique uh, reference id is so we have uh, got this amount please acknowledge this and the uh, billers receive uh, generally issue a receipt or acknowledgement number which is passed back through npci to the cou the last one is check transaction status uh, which is used in case the api of the payment is unsuccessful so it's recommended that before asking the customer to retry you should always check for payment status or this could also be used by uh, stuff like on your payment apps where you see a list of your transaction uh, the transaction history kind of thing this api could also be used to build such a transaction history uh, any questions till now on the purpose and usability of these apps uh, these apis okay uh, i don't see anything so uh, i'll move on i'll also share uh, the request response models for each of these request from a cou point of view and we'll go in detail on each of these uh, parameters one by one so i've posted this on cashless consumers uh, gitlab repo so what i would do is i'm uh, going to paste this in the chat window as well as uh, if someone from hasgeek could also post it on the youtube channel or somewhere that is relevant people could also take a look at this repo independently yeah i'll do that right so yeah uh, let's see the first one which was the biller mdm so there are uh, these are the request parameters in json format which is the request type get mdm response i am not really sure like what uh I, like uh, we're not going to discuss on the architectural uh judgments of this whereas you know a url should identify what request i am making and not a parameter inside the body but these are banks so i'm not really sure what they are thinking or how this is supposed to uh you know work in their case so yeah let's just, we will not go in depth about this but we will uh, check what all the parameters mean so there is this request type and then there's uh, the next level of json which says mdm request details and has some common fields inside which there's a request type again which is get mdm response then there's a merchant ref number this merchant ref number is uh, something that the cou should be generating on their end probably to identify when the response from this request comes back to them so they could match it using this identifier then there are stuff like merchant code agent id username user pass all of which are going to be provided by bank so although it's advertised as interoperable system it's not a very open system wherein you will have to have a relationship with a bank or a ou even before you could start working on the sandbox 
So these are uh, those details. And then there's a store code. So by reading the documentation, what I could deduce from this was that uh, the ATM machines or POS machines, which are devices with their own unique ID, will provide a terminal ID to this parameter. And for other channels, such as say, uh, if it's an app, then there's no unique app ID or something. So uh, you could pass on the merchant code as the store code. Then there's a parameter called search my biller. So if you turn this on to true and pass it a biller ID, the system will search for this particular biller and return the response to you. If you want to get a list of all the billers, well, there's no documentation on whether you should set this to false or you should skip this parameter, whether it's a mandatory one or not. So um, very little idea about this. Then there's an entity type ID, which is also another undocumented field. Not sure what's supposed to be put over here. But again, I'm guessing because this is a closed ecosystem, this parameter would be something that is provided by your bank partner. Then there are certain channel details. Now these channel details in most case correspond to how the user is using this uh, particular request. So in case you want to get a fresh list of, uh, of the billers from your mobile app. So in that case, most likely it will be the requester IP means your mobile devices IP that is going to be sent back to NPCI again, not uh, documented at all by federal banks. So we can't really say which IP this is. And if you send your server's IP, what would happen if you send multiple requests from the same IP, what would happen? None of this, that is a documented behavior. The response to this request is a very elaborate response where uh, again, it's undocumented. So most of these have been educated guess on what this parameter could basically mean. So you have things like uh, biller alias name, probably something that would show up on the customer's UI for easy identification. Tata Power Mumbai, I'm guessing this is the Tata electricity company which operates out of Mumbai then biller effective date from and to this is the date when they were onboarded on BBPS. And this is the date till when they are allowed to collect bills via the BBPS network. Bill coverage. This is some sort of area coverage thing. So in India, in India, Maharashtra and inside Maharashtra, Mumbai, that is the only area where this biller is active. Again, not very sure whether this is used to create some sort of a UI where you get the drop downs or uh, is, is it limited by IP or what do you do with this data? It's not very clear. Then payment amount exactness is exact. This is a very interesting parameter which allows uh, uh, the consumer to make variable amounts of payment. So the possible values here could be exact, exact up, exact down, and there's any so what each of these means is exact means whatever the bill amount is shown to you, you will have to pay exactly that. And there's no editing allowed. Exact up means you could pay either the amount that is shown or anything upwards of that. Exact down means you could pay the displayed amount or anything lower than that. And uh, there's also something called any, in which case uh, there's also the parameters of uh, validation rule, min and max flooring. So user could pay any amount between the min and max floor in that case. Then there's a pillar temp deactivation start. Probably this is like some sort of temporary deactivation as we could see, but again, undocumented parent biller. If there's a biller and sub biller kind of structure, I'm not very sure what this does. Fetch requirement mandatory means, uh, is this bill allowed to be cached and by setting fetch requirement to mandatory, I guess, uh, Tata power is kind of signaling that please do not cache any bills. And every time there's a customer who wants to, uh, who wants to make a payment, please fetch a fresh bill response. And then uh, these are the response parameters. What all would, uh, Tata respond with when you actually try to get the bill from them. This is the accept ad hoc, which means that a user can 
I enter their identifier and pay any amount at any point of time, which they have set to false. Of course, as a power company, they want users to be paying only the bill amount and not random amounts. Whereas this could be set to true in somebody like, let's say, a, a loan or credit company where you want to collect maximum money from the user. So you could set it to true. And whenever the user has some money, they just come on to the COU and make a payment. Then these are the list of payment modes that the biller accepts. In most of the cases, I guess you would be seeing that they are going to accept most of the payment modes that are available via COU. So it is uh, kind of left up to the COU, which of them to display to the users and which of them to collect using that. So it's like a really long list of stuff, wallet, cash, IMPS, it covers most of the common payment modes that are known to us. Uh, and then there's support bill validation. So there's some validation support. Again, uh, my guess is this is related to the uh, fetch requirement mandatory thing where it says that because the bill fetch is mandatory, Tata Power is not going to support a caged bill validation kind of thing, but undocumented, so can't be very sure. Biller name is the full name where we saw an alias name uh, previously. Biller category is electricity, status active, interchange fee. Again, a complicated structure for defining the interchange that the uh, that Tata Power is going to bear on all of these payments. I'm not sure whether this is, uh, comes from the biller side or whether this comes from NPCI side, but it's there in the response. So this is obviously not something that the COU is deciding. This is uh, something that's coming from the backend. So fee description, fee code, this is customer convenience fee and interchange details would be when is the start date of this charge? When, what is the end date of this charge? Transaction amount range max, they have set it to some max value, which I'm not sure anybody is going to pay Tata this much. I don't even know if Tata has this much money of their own, but moving on. So it's a flat fee of rupees zero, a transaction amount minimum range of zero, which means zero or anything upwards of that would levy a percentage fee of zero and a flat fee of zero. So what this object effectively means is that there's no additional fee for the customer because everything is set to zero. Then there's a physical biller fee, which is set to flat fee of 225. I'm guessing this amount is in Paisa. So a physical biller should be able to collect two rupees 25 Paisa extra from the consumer in case they are collecting a, a bill in a physical format. Oh, actually, uh, I think that is uh, the direction actually says it's business consumer. I'm, I would guess that if it's a physical uh, biller, uh, if the mode is paid, then the utility company actually pays the agent. Uh, whereas the other uh, category is C to B, right? Where yeah. the convenience fee flows from consumer to the biller. Right. Yeah, so yeah, it could be that also. And then again, there's one electronic biller fee, which is set to a flat fee of 225. So these are effectively the uh, billing fee or interchange fee or convenience fee, whatever you want to term it as. The next thing is the customer parameters. So this is where it's defined. What parameters would you be sending? to the Tata power system via NPCI to search for the consumer. So uh, the uh, data type is set to numeric. The max and min length is 12, which means it's a 12 digit numeric ID and the param name is consumer number. So on your app, you would most likely see, please enter your consumer number. So this is where they get this configuration from. And then there's a channel wise breakdown. Again, it's my guess that this is a channel wise breakdown of the interfee, uh, interchange fee where it says response code. I don't know what this response code would mean. Uh, my guess is as good as yours. And then there's a start date and start date means there should also be an end date, which is not specified here. So not again, not sure default fee means this should be charged as a default to all the consumers, regardless of other conditions. And there are some other fee, 
which are uh, which are configurable as false or based on some condition and this uh, fee array that we see over here ccf1 ebf if you remember from the previous inter fee change configuration this is the codes that were assigned to each of them ccf1 pbf ebf so this in my uh, opinion this should constitute of a mode wise or a consumers mode wise uh, interchange fee for everything but uh, the three uh, the three M, uh, objects inside this interfee change configuration all say MTI equal to payment. So again, not sure what's supposed to happen over here. And the agent that channel that changes. Related, yeah, that's what I'm getting to. So uh, a hint about this is in the payment channel thing. So if there's a bank branch, you should be charging these two fee. If it's a uh, AGT, uh, which is Aadhaar gateway, I guess then you should be charging these fee and the first one that we saw was the default fee which means if the payment mode matches none of this then charge these fee so uh, this is the other configuration uh, then biller bill id so you remember you could uh, search for a particular biller using the bill id so this is that bill id which is going to be unique for every biller then there's a temporary deactivation end which we saw there was a start date at the beginning biller mode online as uh, Shrikant explained whether it's real time sync synced or not then biller ownership private uh, this is kind of like a data collection point because really to the consumer it doesn't matter whether this is a government company or a private company but this is something npci wants to collect from their biller so why not then these are the payment channels that Biller wants to enable again similar things INT and INTB. Uh, MOB should be mobile, MOBB should be mobile banking, POS machines, MPOS machines, ATM, bank branch, and a minimum maximum limit against each of these payment channels again in PISA. So anything from five rupees to this is uh, effectively 50 lakh rupees, you could pay through a kiosk. So if there's an agent, you could pay anywhere from 1 to 50 lakh rupees in cash. You could walk into a bank branch of the COU and you could pay between 1 to 50 lakh rupees through cash check, whatever the bank branch formalities are. Those are kept outside of this. So because anytime you deposit an amount above 50,000, you need to provide PAN. Probably all those would apply as per banking regulations. But this is what Tata Power has enabled that through a bank branch, this is the minimum maximum limit of amount that I'm going to accept. And with that, we come to the end of this description. Now there's a repeat where you could see this is Sun Direct DTH service. So there'll be parameters related to them. This in all constitutes the MDM, which is the master data management. So there was also a question in the beginning about how, how do the apps get to know and is it instant or how is it? So the caching guidelines say that you should be refreshing this from anywhere between seven to 14 days. Uh, it's totally up to the COU. So I'm my best guess is something like a beam app, which is a standard implementation by NPCI and they want to run it as a flagship product. The beam backend would be fetching the MDM details almost every day. A nimble player like Paytm or PhonePay probably would be fetching it every day or every a couple of days or something like that. Whereas some of the slower channels or agents, uh, agent institutions, which would require some extra training from their side to their agent saying, there's a new biller coming on board. This is what you have to do regarding that. They could be fetching these details in batches of seven days or however. Uh, so yeah, the second request was the bill fetch. So we'll look at the bill fetch request and response. The request type, requesters, IP, merchant reference number, code, agent ID, all of these are the same fields that we saw in the previous request. The uh, interesting part starts here, which is the biller will ID. Now you know that the customer wants to search for their Tata bill. So you will enter Tata's biller bill ID over here. And then uh, the channel details, again, similar thing as before. The customer profile would be 
the uh, we saw that the tata is accepting consumer number so it would say name equal to consumer number and value equal to whatever value consumer has input on the paytm or phone pay or whatever their ui the apps ui and then there's uh, subscription details not sure how this value is supposed to be coming in from the cou my guess is that it should have been coming from the biller side on what the subscription details is so this could also be some kind of caching mechanism where if a consumer has fetched a bill before now in the response you would uh, see very shortly that there's a uh, there's a recurrence uh, kind of criteria where it says monthly so probably the app has just uh, cached that value so this is the response that you get for a bill fetch request euronet is a, a very large uh, tech provider in payments and financial services so this indicates that federal bank is using euronet to process uh, their requests and you get a euronet reference number probably for logging and debugging and tracking purposes uh, bill payment token which uh, which is a unique id for the bill a uh, unique identifier on operator end uh, means this is what tata would be sharing as their bill number response code 00 uh, i have encountered 00 so many times in this that i am starting to feel that this is the success response and all the other responses which uh, in the failure cases would have something other than zero the response message says transaction successful uh, description says transaction successful customer params received from tata is null this is undocumented and again customer params is something that the cou should be sending and not receiving so not sure what this is additional information is things that are displayed on your ui so something like the provider name and the location all of this is displayed on the ui just as a second level of confirmation for the user that they are making the correct payment details against the correct entity here comes the actual thing that a user is concerned about which is the bill details so the uh, response line items are identified here which says early payment amount is 1 rupees and a late uh, payment amount is 3 rupees my guess is uh, this is in paisa because a couple of places it shows it like it very specifically documents it should be in paisa so uh, but not for this specific response item so let's just guess that this is in paisa then there's the customer name the final bill amount the due date so using this due date parameter is how those apps alert you that there's two days left for your bill payment so why don't you make your payment now so that we can do all the settlement and all those and things on the back end and bill number bill date as in the generation date and due date is the last date customer convenience fee is null uh, convenience description is also null because there is no fee and bill period is the month of september so this is the response that you receive from the uh, bill fetch request validation request and response are very very similar so it's uh, like it's it's almost like fetching the same bill again so again not sure why this kind of complexity was introduced in the system whereas it would always have been prudent to always make a fresh bill fetch request and not do things like validation etc so that the chances of error are low so all the details are exactly the same store code username password agent id blah blah and the response that you receive from this is also very very similar to what it looks like in the bill fetch request which is the bill payment token number and now i see a payment reference number also so probably this is a sample re uh, response for a bill which has already been paid by this system or any other system doesn't matter but it's already paid so it shows a payment reference number and i could not find a documentation or a uh, or a sample response for how it would look like if the bill has not been paid my best guess is they would be returning the same bill object again which we saw in the previous request in case the bill is not paid and hence they provided a sample for what happens if the bill is paid the last two parts which are the uh, payment api and the transaction check api right uh, same number of additional fields as before user pass store code blah blah 
Euronet number. So uh, this Euronet number for, should be from the previous response, as in whether it's a validation or a bill fetch request. In that response, you are uh, receiving a Euronet reference number. And to match the payment against that exact bill fetch, you should be passing the same Euronet reference number. Then this is the amount that the user has paid. And then uh, this is the biller's ID. And then this is the bill payment token again from the previous response where you have received where you have received a token against this pay, uh, against this payment. Then there's split pay. I'm guessing this is some sort of uh, marketplace or multiplayer scenarios where you would also split payments between multiple parties. But this uh, these parameters have not been documented, so not really sure how this is supposed to work. Uh, is is uh, split amount is clear, but split pay should be another biller ID, which says effectively that pay this much amount to this bill ID and the balance to my biller's bill ID, or how is it going to work? And then other details like channel details, customer profile info, subscription details, all same as before. Next is the payment information where you tell the pay, uh, mode of payment that is used by the uh, customer and additional details related to that mode. So for example, if the payment mode is card, you could get something like network is Visa or MasterCard and probably uh, based on COU's level of complexity, they could also give you that the bank is this one. The next part is about additional information where customer's name is shown again, most likely. And then uh, there's the bill details. These bill details are the same one that are received in the uh, bill fetch request. So customer name, amount, due date, convenience fee, all of these fields you have to send back. Login name is most likely customer's login name. So this is for those kind of scenarios where let's say uh, your uh, friend does not have Paytm app where Bescom or any other electricity company is listed. He only uses some other random app which does not have a best com listing. So while you are making the bill payment on behalf of your friend or somebody from your family, your name would also be registered over there as the login name since you are logging into this application and making this payment and the bill is paid on behalf of somebody else. Or in case of agents, this would log their, uh, the agent system's login name on uh, to track which agent was it actually who collected this payment. And then if there's convenience fee charged to the customer, what are the details of those? Office pay sounds very much like the payment term on us and office, but not sure what that would uh, represent in a network system such as BBPS. So again, another undocumented field. The response to this is very simple where Euronet uh, returns a new reference number and this is the merchant's uh, reference number, which is the uh, so merchant in this case, because you're operating as a COU refers to the payment app or the agent institution. So this is their reference number. The payment reference number is the one that uh, you passed on to the system as in when the transaction was completed, whatever the COU gets the payment identifier from the bank end. This is that payment reference number response code zero message successful response description successful and additional information where you get a chalan number receipt number acknowledgement number there are so many names to call this by but basically this is a confirmation that whatever payment that you just made to tata power systems using your paytm app actually got registered with tata power and this is the receipt number in their system so in case in future you face any kind of issues regarding your bill payment or you get any calls or if you want to raise some dispute, you could always quote back this number to them. Then there's the transaction status check API. So uh, skipping all the repetitive fields, what you could do is pass it a payment reference number to check the payment against. You could pass it a consumer number, which goes back to very uh, first of the things that uh, somebody from the audience, I guess they said that you keep hearing about uh, public credit registry and other related stuff that is going to be built on BBPS. So it is, uh, I read somewhere in the guideline where it's uh, recommended that the COUs make 
a unique uh, note of the consumers on their side and share that data with npci so this is most likely going to be that consumer number which means uh, something like in case of an app you would have a unique user id so you would have to share that and then there's a transaction list uh, from and to date where which you could use to search for the transactions and other channel details again same thing ip etc then merchant ref number so whatever you received in the payment response as the merchant's ref number you could pass that back or you could pass a euronet reference number so my guess is this euronet ref number merchant ref number to from date consumer number payment ref number all of these fields are individual filters that you can use to search from a vast sea of data that the bbps is collecting from all the uh, billers and consumer side of ous and this is what will help you narrow down to the transaction that the customer is looking for and this is the kind of response that you get for a uh, for a transaction status request response code message whatever charges customer mobile number not sure how they arrived at this mobile number since in none of the previous request we have seen this to be passed on as a mandatory field but this is something that you receive from the transaction status api so there is some sort of data sharing happening somewhere which the customer does not know about obviously and the list of transactions based on whatever the filter parameters were passed so payment ref number merchant ref number euronet number amount transaction date status agent id and biller id so all of these details will help you create that nice little passbook kind of listing that you see on your apps or if a customer is at an agent institution they could check their past transaction history uh, to see how many bills have been paid and what is pending etc so that's basically the run through of all these five apis uh, i would encourage people to take a look at this repo which is available on cashless consumers uh, gitlab profile called federal bank bbps apis uh, the sandbox that i tried to uh, work this with is actually not a sandbox meaning uh, a sandbox would imply that you could make some request or play around with some of the stuff but all of this seems to be a very closed ecosystem kind of thing where we saw fields and not only one or two but there were like at least five fields such as store code merchant ref number uh merchant code username user pass all of which have to be provided by the bank to work around this so even if you uh, i've uh, linked it to the federal bank's developer portal but even if you go there and try to do something with the apis create a account login none of that is actually going to work because there's no uh there's no documentation in words it's just a list of request response structures which we've already run through and there's uh, not even a proper json schema listing or xml listing of uh, about what any of these fields does so that's one of my biggest quirks with this thing you could say that is not able to actually make request response and check what these things do that was the end of my uh, my technical demonstration on this not very technical because all of these things were based on a guess but i'll be open to any questions that we have now okay so i'll answer the existing ones while people can type in the new ones uh, so sham as so npca will maintain all transactions happened on bbps minimum 5 years the answer is yes are there details how this information is used uh, are they any cross selling for different companies so uh, they are going to maintain it for 5 years and uh, and their expectation is probably within that 5 years the public registry will get a legislative framework and then they just dump all this data there and uh, that's for the npci but uh, the individual ous also have this data so it's just that npci being the master uh, aggregator has all the data of all the bbp payments that happens on the third party ecosystem uh, whereas the individual ous kind of have their own uh, data uh, and they are again they would use it that for again credit scoring for filing etc rti has any way to figure out how much builders has lost bill payment share Well, post BBS, there are two ways to look at it. So one is how much bill desk. Uh, so uh, the bill desk is 
previously doing two things. So one is maintaining the biller relationship as well as accepting the GMO payments. So if you are in like say 2012 versus 2013 and there is no VVPS, you go to a, your electricity site and it's most probably linked to the builder's gateway where you enter your card number on the builder's gateway. So builders does two things. So one is process your card payment as well as, uh, you know, process, uh, charge a fee for the, with the uh, biller. Uh, so it does two things. So what BVPS does, it is actually slices that. So you no longer are obligated to use BVPS, uh, sorry, build desk for making the payment. So you can use Paytm for making the payment. So that portion of, uh, so that single transaction that build desk used to do two, two things. One is catering the consumer and the catering the business side or the biller is now split and the consumer side app uh, is it's mostly the apps that are rolling the roast and mostly whichever apps give the most cash back it could be Amazon, it could be Google Pay, it could be Phone Pay, it could be Paytm, whatever it is, like the flavor of the day, right? Uh, that gets the most transactions. Whereas uh, on the biller side, it will always be still bill desk because that's the OU that the electricity board has uh, tied up with. Uh, so that uh, volume is unchanged. Uh, there are two ways to look at it. One is uh, how many people had Bill Desk had access to uh, pre BVPS, uh, and uh, in, in which case Bill Desk payments may not have happened through, say, the agent networks and so on, uh, unless Bill Desk also had the agent network and had managed that. Now, in this case, currently NPCI manages that and. Uh, their uh, NPCI approach is basically lower the cost of processing all this by making like a zero MDR kind of thing and make more uh, bill payments happen. And when the more bill payments happen, so it's basically commoditizing of these transactions. And when that happens, uh, more data is generated. And NPCI's way is like, uh, we'll use this data and let uh, FinTech monetize data, like how every other FinTech monetizes data in India. So. To, uh, to answer how much whether Buildesk has lost or uh, gained uh, is, a, is, a, is a tough question. And uh, one needs to also look holistically what Buildesk's and its investors' ambitions are uh, in, in terms of this data uh, and, and how they use it uh, holistically to say whether they have like lost or one out of uh, BVPS. So uh, with that, I'll probably get... Uh, uh, so, uh, Swapnil asks uh, different uh, bill aggregation companies. Uh, I think uh, Bill Desk is one. Uh, there is probably Bill Junction. Uh, and there is probably Tech Process. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if there are more. Uh, but Bill Desk is probably the, uh, the major market share holder in the uh, bill aggregation space. Uh, and uh, yes, Bill Desk, uh, prominent player from the issuing side. I mean. Uh, not not the issuing side. I mean, if you uh, strictly see, it's, it's the acquiring side, right? Because if you rate the builder as a merchant, uh, then Buildisk is the prominent acquirer. Issuing is most likely like all these payment apps uh, kind of thing. Uh, so I'll quickly go through. We are kind of running late, but thanks for staying along with us. We'll probably finish another ten more minutes. Uh, there are a couple of things in the chat. So question is, does Buildesk own the data of their billers? So when it comes to data, right, uh, it, it's, it's anybody's guess. So we, in India does not have a data protection law. Uh, we even have a committee on something called as non-personal data. We'll, we'll look, look at closely at how at the data in, in these slides. So firstly, I'll uh, focus the individual privacy part. Uh, does privacy exist in bill payments? Uh, is it something like BVPS kind of uh, person? Uh, uh, the answer is it's it's depends on the implementation. So to give an example, there are billers who kind of give, let you do a free search without even captchas uh, and uh, fetch information on say a random customer ID, which can sequentially be generated. And so you could potentially write a script and download the entire state's electricity bill data. Uh, whereas there are again builders also who have a, like a closed wall setup where like you have to create a profile, you have to link your account and only then your your own bill data alone will be displayed and so on. So uh, bill payments, uh, there are two cases where one where the builder exposes everything and uh, the other where uh, the builder chooses to expose only for the uh, authenticated customers. 
So in the case of pharma, there is no privacy anyway, uh, and credit scoring for companies where uh, scrapping these and uh, making profiles of it, so privacy did not exist. But in the case of ladder, uh, it was hard, and uh, that data was like closed. Uh, what did BBPS do? Uh, BBPS kind of made every biller uh, forcefully participate in that, in the sense. As I was explaining, in the case of power sector, uh, as part of the UDAI, uh, there is a mandate to kind of uh, have these collections through uh, BVPS and, and almost all the electricity discoms in India uh, joined uh, BVPS. And uh, so in that sense, they kind of gave their billing data in a more machine friendly uh, identity link. And this is what uh, Akshay was uh, referring a while back, like where did that mobile number come in directly, right? And this is where the role of NPCI comes in, where uh, the mobile and other uh, data is anyway linked to uh, NPCI in the form of UPI and other mapper. And uh, now even your uh, bills are getting identity tagged. So previously, let's say five years back, your bills are not identity tagged. It's just an electricity bill. So you know, somebody just pays that electricity bill, right? So. Uh, Right now, uh, it's, it's a lot more personal data and uh, what can be inferred from a bill, right? Like uh, somebody can actually map out uh, tenant landlord relationships. Uh, payables uh, are all outflows from household. Uh, like as more and more biller categories gets added, like uh, currently we have electricity and water and say gas, uh, school fees is going to get added. So at, at one point, you might have like a list of billing categories. <laughs> And if BVPS becomes the uh, preferred uh, payment network for these collections, all the household expenses would be basically made on this network. I mean, by household expenses, I mean uh, non-merchant uh, payments. So while the merchant payments will still happen through card or BPI, the non-merchant recurring kind of payments like school fees or a municipal tax or a water bill or electricity bill, all these uh, consistent outflows of a household uh, will be going through BVPS and as uh, this is going to get probably used in uh, public registry uh, scoring uh, and this basically can potentially lead to a sort of household scoring model so what does this household spend as a whole so they be like three mobile phones uh, one internet connection one uh, dth and so on what's the total spend of this now all this data is going through one network uh, and that network can easily and tomorrow, if say uh, EMI collections also happen through this, then that kind of gives pretty much the entire uh, entire chunk of uh, the constant outflows recurring uh, in a month, which helps scoring. Uh, right? It it could even give you bizarre data like consumption patterns or your holidays or your foreign travel. If somebody goes to US and locks their phone for six months, their electricity bill is static, right? So, and now that this is identity linked, it's it's easier to kind of figure that out. Uh, and uh, most importantly, they, uh, one thing that most profiling companies used to track is basically the ability to pay, uh, payment behaviors, are they paying late, are they paying in full, and so on. And, and this kind of uh, metadata rich uh, transaction footprint can kind of lead to more targeted profiling. And it's not just about the privacy of individuals, it's also privacy of businesses and their agent networks, like how much agents. Uh, are these uh, entities employing? What are their receivables data? And this is particularly interesting in the case of the electricity companies. We'll come to that in a bit. Uh, what's their collection performance, right? And uh, there's one more thing uh, that we didn't cover in the business standards uh, going to the doc. Uh, there's also money laundering uh, compliance that is part of the BVPS. So you can't pay more than 50,000 rupees uh, in, in one or a set of transactions. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the BVPS guidelines say that uh, every OU must maintain unique uh, number uh, for each channel mode for each customer. So they would probably know down to your mobile app, whether you have paid from your mobile app or your wife's mobile app, and that level, and what all details when you have paid. And each thing gets has to have a unique ID. And the justification for that they give is probably like we want to prevent money laundering, right? Uh, and BVPS kind of gives you all this data in a very machine-friendly manner. And uh, as you've seen, like the responses are machine-friendly and the kind of data that BVPS handles uh, and it's available to the larger players uh, in a machine-friendly format could mean that uh, AI algorithms could uh, 
could make a lot more sense, right? And we'll come to the electricity sector or broadly the collection problem in India. Uh, uh, even even though we had uh, electricity uh, generation issues sorted out, uh, it, the last mile was still not collected. There were still villages without electricity, and uh, this was sometime back in uh, uh, like three four years back. Uh, so where uh, the crux of the matter was, uh, can the poor afford electricity? The electricity companies were not willing to issue uh, electricity connections because they did not have a means to get the bill collected. Uh, so uh, that kind of tells one story on the electricity sector. And the other part of that is also most of the discoms in India are state-owned uh, and the financial status are all in red as if they have the huge loans. And uh, there's a constant push uh, kind of get into the electricity subsidy regime where uh, the consumer pays the market price of electricity and then uh, gets whatever subsidy from the state instead of having a subsidized tariff slab. Uh, and this has been a constant uh, lobbying point by uh, industries where today, most states, in most states, the consumers are actually getting cross subsidized from industrial charges. They want that to be reversed, whereas where the consumers pay uh, the charge uh, so that uh, industries also pay less and there is no cross subsidization from industries and to consumers. Uh, so this could be, the, the whole DVPS can be seen in that sense as a huge data collection exercise for uh, power sector direct benefits transfers and uh, also valuation of discoms uh, when, when it comes to their receivables data. Now that all their bills are available uh, in, in a single system, like uh, you want to actually value like how much is actually uh, these entities are receiving uh, in real time and uh, that is verified through this payment system, right? And uh, I mean, a larger part of that, this is the importance of this data comes in the context of uh, uh, the recently announced uh, privatization of discoms or stopping of free power to farmers uh, and, and as part of the Atma, Mirbar, Bharat. Uh, there is also another push uh, that is being made to kind of have uh, water uh, in the municipal cities uh, charged as utilities and uh, let uh, uh, the city administration uh, collect water charges based on consumption rather than, uh, say, a standard fee or a property tax kind of uh, system currently in place. And this collection problem is not just for electricity and uh, water. Right? It's, it's for anything that if you go beyond a certain level, uh, like outside the city, uh, like the internet has not penetrated in India and uh, broadband, the physical line broadband has not penetrated. Even though there's a large broadband project for uh, internet for Bharatnet, the last mail has not been connected simply because there isn't a way where uh, collections can be ensured across these large uh, uh, large geographic area for uh, provision of services where there is a very minimal human interaction because you want to give a connection and assume that people will pay while that actually is possible in a city where people kind of pay all their bills. Uh, in rural, how do you kind of enforce that uh, payment behavior and, and where you don't even have the infrastructure to make the payment and BVPS kind of puts in the payment uh, infrastructure part of that either through you know, agent networks or through a self-service apps like Beam or whatever. Uh, it, it kind of improves uh, the infrastructure for companies to collect uh, for whatever services they provision. right? And it also provides us a channel for payday loans or digital lending companies to kind of do low ticket size collections. Like how do you collect uh, 50 rupees a day uh, for like next 14 days? Uh, and this, when this connection is not possible, like in uh, other modes, it can still be possible through the low cost mode if the charges are like kept lower and uh, BPS kind of uh, tries to do that or provides an infrastructure where like, you know, somebody can pay like 500 a week uh, through this agent and the agent will still charge only 10 rupees. So it's still uh, cheaper for uh, overall cost of uh, credit and collections back to the digital lending industry. Now, who owns all this data, especially the aggregate non-personal data, like how much did each state discount get uh, received and so on. Uh, it's, it's a big question, but uh, and sadly there is no uh, legislative uh, or uh, policy-based uh, statute as of now and NPCA kind of gets to have everything and uh, billers also, uh, the biller OUs also have this data and they, they are kind of using that data in all possible ways, both for business and uh, individually.
credit profiling is often talked uh, what are the ways people do credit profiling spending patterns uh, are you making defaults on your bill payments are you making full or part payment uh, are you making by credit card or are you skipping your school fees and so on uh, it could also act as a channel to kind of say who wants a loan to pay these bills right uh, and this could be like you know whatever google adsense way of your uh, lending industry uh, where you kind of deeply monitor every transaction and say that uh, given ad saying that you need a note right and uh, this could not just about uh, it's not just about scoring individuals it should all, it could also be used to score businesses where uh, the businesses themselves can be scored based on the customer profile of each business imagine you run a gym and you have a subscription service and you collect all this data through bbps now with bbps what it allows is uh, your gym could be rated like uh, scored saying that you have uh, whatever 50% of your uh, gym membership is from a high value base right because every bill payment is now identity linked and score linked you can actually score businesses uh, based on their customer base as well and of course the public credit which is being talked about is being referred in the uh, the tender expression of interest uh, that has been uh, approved uh, and it it involves pulling bbps data quickly uh, we reported a privacy breach where like multiple labs were like fetching all the bill details uh, without the consent of its consumer we reported this in october 2018 uh, npci then followed up with a circular saying that you must always have a uh, uh, mandate uh, consent for fetching auto fetch uh, and should provide you an option opt out uh, option for consumers to kind of uh, notify that they don't want their bills to be automatically fetched but sadly to this day the bill fetch is continuing and this is evident from npci's own data where each bill is now fetched at least seven times because uh, they they put a list of uh, how many transactions that happened and how many bill fetch transactions that happened and uh, the ratio is like currently 1 is to 7 and so in, in one sense i would always say that uh, if there is a way pay to first party that is your own biller biller's website or uh, a cash collection point or whatever right uh, so there was a recent uh, thing last week saying that npci uh, asked uh, end bilateral ties this is this happened basically in a pre bbps era where there were biller who use and there were consumer apps uh, to give a case in point biller who use could be a bill desk and a consumer app could be a paytm and even before bbps had come in on live they had a system of uh, having a business agreement and Uh, charging uh, and letting ability uh, users of paytm uh, pay these bills uh, through paytm and pay, the paytm had worked out a commercial with builders right and what npci said last week is that you should not have these bilateral ties and you should uh, always use bbps if you are uh, using two different entities and uh, in their uh, circle they also say that uh, you must uh, notify all these existing relationship and also migrate existing customer data i mean this is like literally stealing out data uh, out of private contracts and uh, from any any lawyer watching this uh, right to make contracts when part of a network is is under challenge and npci is kind of uh, putting this out uh, and and saying nobody can uh, collect bill outside if they are part of bbps they have to route all transactions through bbps which essentially means the data is finally captured as per bbps uh, data collection standards which essentially means that there is no right to privacy right and with that i will come to a close and we'll ask for questions any questions uh, there's been a pending one from vivek who asked how is the success rate for bill payments on vvps are there any uh, downtime or webhook api so uh, the bill payment rates on vvps depend on a lot of parties so uh, right now as i demoed there's a set of apis through which an app like uh, paytm phone pay or let's just call some pay so this some payment app will connect to federal bank which will connect to npci which will connect to a bou which will connect to a uh, biller server at the end so other than uh, npci even if any of these other parties go down then the payments would be affected and there's effectively no downtime or webhook kind of api because uh, what npci expects is that the bous and the cous will be pinging it with a heartbeat api and if it doesn't receive heartbeat npci will assume that the party is down whether it's 
on the COU side or BOU side. So that is about the downtime in webhooks and about the success rate uh, for certain larger uh, set of billers. It's pretty good, such as I would uh, uh, like my personal experience has been that an electricity bill payment very rarely fails. But when you have uh, other smaller parties that are coming online now, so for example, now there's a whole new uh, loan repayments in this kind of uh, sections and even smaller merchants who are localized to, let's say, one state or a couple of states only. All of them are trying to get onto BBPS because it's a more omni-channel kind of approach where they don't have to spend any uh, money on creating a, a agent network or anything for cash collection also. So all of uh, given all the benefits of the BBPS, they are trying to get onto this, but I'm not sure how reliable their systems are. So again, I don't have the exact success rate data for BBPS. But the number of touch points have not reduced. It has actually gone up compared to first party payments. So there's a lot of scope for, uh, for failures. Are there any questions on YouTube? Nothing. So any other questions? Uh, Uh, so uh, another question by Ravi here is could the bill fetch be higher because people try multiple apps before paying for discount and cashback, not discounting that apps do fetch bills multiple times for sure. Uh, generally, I would not say that it's higher because of multiple paying because discounts and stuff you see on the app interface much before you actually enter your identifier. So it's, it's category wise, like Let's say electricity bill get 50 rupees on payment of 500 or above. So you don't need to actually put in your bill amount. You have a general idea on whether I'm consuming uh, 500 or more worth of electricity every month or not. So there's a general ballpark guess. So it's not because of discounting purposes, but the other one uh, for sure that apps do will fetch multiple times on their own. So this is again, one of the very significant privacy points that Srikanth has been trying to highlight, which is to say that when, uh, when a app gets to know that this is a category which generates a monthly bill, they automatically do this without customer consent on fetching your electricity bill for the next month and saying, because you paid electricity bill for this account last month from your Paytm app, why don't you do the same again? And the due date is approaching soon. So yes, payment apps do that on their own. That could be one of the reasons. And that's a, a very good area to also highlight the kind of privacy issues that brings in, wherein the customer never said that, show me my bill every month and I want to pay it through Paytm. But they anyway fetch this data and there's no check on this, though there has been some communication, which I guess Srikanth would be able to eliminate us on better. Yeah, so uh, the NPCI circular here actually uh, there was issued in 2018 it said two things. One is you should always mandate consent and you should also provide an opt out feature uh, because when it was first noted, Srinivas, uh, I'll give you the example where Srinivas had actually uninstalled the app and he no longer had that app on his phone. But this app actually sent him a mail saying that your bill is this much and pay. And this was after uninstalling the app. So it's, it's essentially that these apps, even after uh, you uninstalling them, they still have your details and they do fetch these bills, right? So, and there is no opt-out provision. Whereas NPCI uh, Circular said you must provide opt-out provision. And this, till today, there has been no app that actually complies with this uh, requirement. And I wrote a follow-up letter in 2020 as well. And for which there is probably no response yet. And I'll probably think what uh, next course of action that I need to take. But all these are still, uh, they are not legally bound yet in, in one sense because we don't have a data protection law. 
uh, but it's important for us to know this because we do know that all this data will not then go to public registry and which will be like a master uh, data set and this is not just about uh, privacy and credit scoring it's also at some level about surveillance uh, because you you are uh, eventually going to end up uh, giving every little transaction detail uh, to uh, a government body which kind of has a panoptican view on all your payments okay there is one hand up uh, arti has a question arti you can unmute and talk Arti, you could you could you unmute and talk? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, Arti, we can hear you. Go ahead. You can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I wanted to check as you said that you know NPC has not been responding uh, on this uh, you know privacy issue or like consent based based issue. Uh, it, so they have several portfolios right upi so of course we know that on upi they kind of uh, make con uh, like customer consent uh, on priority so is there any other uh, you know product portfolio where they do the same thing i mean uh, they allow a payment providers to you know fetch a book, any any sort of information uh, you know apart from bbps i mean um it's a good question uh, any other uh, payment system where there is a bill fetch the closest example that i could think of is actually on upi and this happened a while back there was a circular noting uh, that there should be more caution on the kind of access the sdks give I to give an example way back in 2017 when the upi sdks were released and there were apps that were integrating the sdks onto their app Uh, they did give uh, the app uh, apps the provision to kind of do uh, a balance check or uh, in, in some cases even uh, a, uh, a name check so you can actually verify uh, which name is categorized with which vpa right and this name to vpa conversion is still unmetered and why one can still argue that this resolution is also a privacy breach because what happens tomorrow when whatsapp pay comes right uh, what, like whatsapp today does not actually have your legal name uh, like you can still go and get a, any sim card uh, of anybody it could be your grandmother's grandfather's and you could use whatsapp on it and whatsapp has no way in knowing what your name is uh, on that phone number but once you link that with your bank account and say activate whatsapp pay then whatsapp suddenly has the ability to kind of get your real name uh, and there is a facebook policy on real names that people with real name only have to have an account and that could easily now be extended to whatsapp uh, when whatsapp upi uh, does happen uh, so this is another example where again uh, and i can say till today i think there is no restriction on upi psps resolving any vpa uh, back to uh, any payment address that when by payment address you get the entire account number as well as uh, the uh, the payment the account holder name as a response and i don't think npc even publishes that data as to how many resolutions of a vpa has happened uh, whereas uh, that is that does not require a customer consent i mean you as a upi user uh, would never know if i take my phone and type your vpa and say pay uh, most pay upi apps will show your name right now what I, i did not ask your permission to get resolve your name and the psp in addition to uh, displaying the name will also get actually the account number as well wow okay mm. and the next level of similar thing happens with the things like google pay where most of our phone pay where most of the people are registered via their phone number so just by the virtue of having your phone number with me i could look up certain details regarding your name account and all those stuff makes sense thank you
yeah anyone else who has any other questions comments want to share something um, about this session or uh, what what was covered or what you liked or what you didn't like what you expected what was not covered anyone who wants to kind of share uh, before we close uh hi lakshmi it has been a very uh, i will say educative uh, so far means uh, thanks for the effort and thanks for collecting so much information and the details for us uh, the really the part of like we are in india i think it's still very early because when we see europe and uh, you uh, london or basically western economies the things are very much uh, tied down like the personal data privacy is gdpr so i think in india it is like we need to push for those sort of things even with the cons- this basically the consumer data and like the customers payment data and these things mostly have been taken so lightly it it, it doesn't like uh, it is like still we couldn't find so many of the details of this uh, apis i think uh, there are not clear like exact fields and all those things i think uh, might be we don't know yet will the india it will take might be some time to get some of these details but uh, not sure whether there are any ngos or any other open uh, banking uh, systems which are basically pushing india towards that if uh, there are some like how we can contribute or how we can be part of that i have no idea about any open banking efforts outside of this uh, when it comes to data and uh, i'll quickly go through some of the comments uh, uh ravi mentioned that uh, bill fetch cannot be tracked using app uninstalls because there are multiple people who don't uninstall who uninstall the app and still use the web interface yes uh but yeah but the more point is uh, if a user still has the app you should have the option to uh, opt out of this recurring bill fetch uh rajit asks how difficult it is to become a ou right now how start startup friendly is the bbps space um i think that's a very broad ended question uh, very theoretically speaking rbi has opened up the bbps ou licensing for anybody uh, with an odd app as long as you fulfill their capital requirements and uh, rbi's standard uh, uh, checks on the founders and uh, what they call us uh, checks on the people who run the company you are technically uh, will be given the uh, license to issue but what's missing probably is uh, the business model uh, and how many of these ous which are like non bank ous will actually survive because if there is no money to be made uh, and we are already in a zero ntr era which the payment companies are facing right now and uh, customer convenience fees are not still uh, live on bbps and when with, without that there is no probably clear proof of profitability except like data gathering and even that data gathering you never know because the state creates the public registry there is no point in uh, uh, any entity holding the data because now the data is a property of the state so in in that sense i don't know what the business needs for bbps are still right there and the market is already crowded with 30 odd bbps ou so uh, what would you do as 31st is something that you need to answer yourself as well okay uh is there a concern framework with dvps is it from i script i think the concern framework is something different and outside of dvps i would say uh, and uh, i don't think concern framework and dvps are related in that sense yeah okay, any other questions I don't see any other questions. I think uh, it's been good two and a half hours. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, thanks, Akshay, uh, for the demo. Yeah, thanks to all the participants and Hasvi and Shrikanth, of course.
for guiding me through how to do this. This is the first time I'm participating in any of these kind of sessions. Yeah, we look forward to your feedback on like uh, how do we do the more of these study circle sessions where we kind of dig deep like what we did today. Uh, I get that we kind of stretched over time, uh, but if there is something else that you want to share, uh, feedback, uh, feel free to drop by and let us know and uh, tell us uh, what other uh, sessions that you want to hear. Um, We'll probably be having the next fortnight uh, session. Uh, we'll come up with the announcement early next week. And uh, uh, till then, like, stay tuned. And if you have not joined the Cashless Consumer Telegram channel, please do join uh, uh, the Telegram channel. It's uh, t.me slash cashless consumer. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye.